Yeah, but you specialise in um, thoroughbreds, off the track thoroughbreds, and um, how to help bring them into work and be happy, happy horses. Yep, that's right. Cool. So tell us a little bit then, Kirsty, about how you came to be doing that and what your passion really is. So um, I grew up in Suffolk, not too far away from Newmarket. So I've been sort of surrounded by thoroughbreds all my life, really. And I just, they're a breed that I've always captured for heart and I've owned thoroughbreds and I've trained thoroughbreds and and I've always loved them from that sense, but I wasn't really um, that aware of all the issues from racing into riding horses until I started working for the British Thoroughbred Retraining Centre. So I started working for them June 2017, so three years ago. Um, and it just became quite sort of obvious, really, that people who are, are, are good horse people, they, you know, they know what they're doing, but suddenly then just struggle with retraining racehorses. And what I realised is that racing's quite shut down. I think it's quite closed off to the equestrian world. And there doesn't seem to be a flow of information from one industry to the other. So people just don't understand what happens in racing on a daily basis. And therefore, they, when these horses come to them, they change their whole world within a day, almost. And they, you can get some quite major reactions from that. Um, I've sort of likened it recently to you know, our situation in lockdown, is that that sudden change of everything you know suddenly not being everything you know is similar to a racehorse that everything that they do in training is so different to what would happen on a DIY livery yard I mean it's worlds apart planets apart and then some of them obviously adapt and coat and they are very adaptable horses they're amazing but some of them don't and they need a bit of time so that was sort of one of the things that became quite obvious to me is that there's a real leap and just by a lack of understanding people were struggling with these horses and people take on these horses out of the best intentions they really do um you know all, all sorts of you hear it you know grooms going to take them on because they're coming out racing but they can't find a home or their pal's got a field etc cetera, etc cetera, and and they end up with a horse that actually they don't know very much about where it's come from or its history or you know, even down to, I don't find people even go back to the trainers and say, what injuries have they had? What routine did they have? What did they eat? What was, you know, I, I think people are always a bit shocked by things like racehorses have very, very little hay in their diet. You know, it's a very small amount. And then you, you, you bring them out and you put them on a livery yard and you just stuff them full of haylage that they've never had before. So, but on top of that, where are anybody, where's anybody going to learn about it? I can't find any training courses. I can't find anybody who's going to tell me. Or, And I just thought there's just a gap here, a real gap in the market to be able to offer people the understanding of the physical and the mental demand that racing places on horses. Um, and just having that knowledge to then be able to use it to retrain them effectively. Um, one of the biggest things you see is they come out of racing and people think, I don't want to get on them straight away. So I'll lunge them. Well, a racehorse can't lunge. It's never been around in a circle in its life. You know, I mean, that's probably being a little bit unfair. There are some trainers now who do a bit more in the way of schooling. But, you know, the real old school trainers, they don't. They, they go in straight lines. And if you ever see a racehorse go on the lunge for the first time, it's, it's a scary event, you know, and it, it largely requires straight lines and corners and a, a, a lot of falling in and and then eventually they, they, they physically can't cope and then they just have a breakdown and then they explode and and then people then get scared to get on them and and it there's that vicious circle but if you'd understood the what their muscles have been through to be trained as a racehorse you'd never stick them on a lunge you know it, it would be one of the last things you'd ever do you know and you, you you'd be better off schooling them large around a you know a 40 20 arena than you would try and stick them on a on an eight meter circle on a lunge line so it's just silly things like that really um yeah and we and we go into all sorts you know we go into the actual physical forces of 
racing and what impact that has on their muscles and the skeleton and and the kind of injuries that 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 throws up um, and we look at it all in in detail and and i think it just then makes you think well when i'm going to get on my horse i might not do x y and z because i realized when they ran you know three miles around a national hunt track you know quite you know several times a year they're probably not ready to do maybe what i'm asking them to do um so yeah it's just come trying to come at it from a bit of a different angle really and so what do you find kind of some of the biggest myths around um x races and things like that that you kind of help people overcome um there's sort of two schools of thought really there's there's the, the myth that they're all psychopathic and will kill you and that's not true there are lots out there who are really quiet um and one of the reasons they don't make it in racing is actually they don't have enough oomph about them and if you get one of those you're really really lucky because they tend to be fairly easy to retrain um and i think that's sort of one of the other things is that a lot of thoroughbreds are more backwards than people realize um they they don't want to be in charge and they don't want to take charge if they can absolutely help it they they will absolutely let you be in charge and i think sort of the psychoticness that that reputation that they have really does come from people asking the wrong questions of them and it's a survival mechanism it it becomes the fight or flight response at that point and they feel like you you put them in a position where they either physically or mentally can't cope with what you're asking them to do. Um, and I think if you if you approach it right and you get them mentally and physically in the right place, you will probably have a much easier time. But I think it's having the confidence to do that, especially if you're on a livery yard, because there will always be somebody over your shoulder who knows how to do it better than you. Then they might never have owned a thoroughbred. So I think that's one myth that, you know, I think from the livery or the or the, the main horse owner just thinks all thoroughbreds are just going to bolt off with you and and are going to kill you. And, and that's, that's genuinely not true. The other side of it is there is this uh, new, it's quite new sort of thought that all thoroughbreds are truly versatile and you can get them off the track and you can do anything with them. And in a sense, that is true they are really adaptable and they're really intelligent but depending on how long they've been in racing and what their physical issues are that might not necessarily be true and I think the uh, one of the things that the BTRC do which is the, the rehab yard up in Lancashire is they try to assess horses for suitability of job which I think is really as a real key point that that if you have a horse that's been in racing and it's raced quite hard, so maybe it's been on the flat for a couple of years and then it's gone out and done national hunt, it might have got to a point where the trainer is injecting its hocks every six weeks. And then you don't know anything about that. It goes to a retraining yard. It then gets sold on and you want a dressage horse. As I say, there's this now this feeling that any racehorse can go out and do ROR dressage at a certain level. But I'm pretty sure that a horse that's having his hocks injected every six weeks isn't going to do dressage to any real level and would probably suit being a hack horse and, and make a really nice hack horse. You know, there are there are horses out there, you know, that all the work riders know that there's there's a horse on the yard that bolts with them on the on the gallops. We you don't want uh, you know a middle of the road rider to end up with that horse, but a professional could make an amazing event horse out of that so i think that's they are versatile but i think there needs to be an understanding that you can't just take any horse give it to any person and do any job with it i know that's probably true of all horses in all spheres but there's a real marketing push that you these horses are extremely versatile and very adaptable and and i'm not saying they're not but i think you have to know what that horse has been through and you know did it retire with a tendon injury you know why why did it stop racing why what are those reasons and I mean I'm sure every trainer in England's going to hate me soon because I just keep telling people ring the trainer and ask them what was he like in training what did he do why did he stop what was his attitude like because you're more likely to have a successful partnership 
if you get the right horse. Um, and I think there's a real void between the two industries, between racing and people who take on X race horses, is that I would suspect the majority of people who have X race horses know nothing about their previous racing career. So they could have had a totally unsuitable horse for them. But it goes, you know, they get, tend to go through a lot of dealers and retrainers. And then it's almost like that previous history is irrelevant because they've they've taken the next step. Um, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of retrainers out there who are really good at placing horses with the right people. But equally so, there aren't that many retrainers and you've got over 5,000 racehorses retiring every single year. So a lot of people end up with freebies, horses for a pound, and, uh, you know, scarily, people buy their teenagers racehorses because they're a pound and they don't come from a horsey background. And you hear that a lot. You know, it was a cheap horse, so, you know, they didn't want to invest loads of money, so they bought it for a pound off somebody, which is frightening, but it, it does happen. So, so, yeah, I think those are the two biggest myths. Yeah, yeah, I think that I've certainly heard those kind of ones for sure. Uh, and interesting, isn't it, how they are polar to each other as well, you know, depends who you listen to. So, yeah, you know, as with everything, as with everything in horses, you know, it's the right thing for the right horse for the right owner and finding that perfect match can be a minefield no matter what background that horse has had, isn't it? Yeah, so, definitely. Having heard that then, you know, some people would be put off from going for an ROR and others will be thinking, no, you know, actually they sound they sound great. What would be your advice then if someone does think, actually, do you know what? I, I actually would really love an off-the-track thoroughbred. I like the idea of helping a horse that has been in that kind of background. Um, I love the look of them and they are beautiful, aren't they? Thoroughbreds are absolutely stunning. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I they're, they're the right kind of height and shape and what have you for me. It's something I'd really like to do, but wow, now I'm thinking, what a minefield, what do I do about it? What would be your advice to one of the things actually, yeah, that, that, that could work for me? I think, you know, that's, as I say, one of the reasons we set up all the courses, the online courses and the hands-on clinic that we did just before lockdown was, it was just learn about it. Because if you, if you know where they've been and, and what they've done, it's really not that hard to then work out a plan. You know, one of the biggest things is make sure the team of people you have around you are right. So having a riding instructor that knows nothing about thoroughbreds is no good to you because what you'll find is they show very subtle pain signs and you get a lot of instructors who go, no, push them through it, work them harder. And actually they miss some really major things and you can end up with real trouble on your hands. So I think it's working with people who understand the breed, who are sympathetic, you know, the sort of uh, give it a kick and let it go, it doesn't quite apply to thoroughbreds, I don't think. I, I, personally, I don't, I don't think so. So I think you just have to, you have to be able to ride sympathetically and you have to understand what you're feeling underneath you. And I think in that sense, you need a really good instructor behind you who can help you work through just that transitional period because they have to learn to use totally different muscles you know and it's a massive transformation that they have to go through physically to become a riding horse and that's why I try to teach people about the biomechanics of racing and we look at the muscles that they use as a racehorse and then the muscles that they want to use as a riding horse and the kind of muscles that you want them to use well they've never even used half of them before and they're not very strong and you know, racehorses are all off the forehand. They pull from the front and they don't use their back end. And then we get on as sort of riding horse, you know, equestrians. And we want them to sit down on their hocks and we want them to lift up through their core and want them to round over their back. Well, they've never really done that. You know, they've been as hollow as anything forever. So it takes a lot, <clears throat> you know, just down to things like because of the shape that they keep in racing, you know, the ligament that holds the spine together is naturally shorter and contracted. So they can't physically stretch over their back. It takes time. And so you have to, I think by learning what it is about and understanding that the process is different to if you're going to say take on a four-year-old and break it yourself, because um, you're starting with a blank canvas there. Um, if you take a four-year-old off the racing track, you're not starting with a blank canvas. You're starting with something very different and probably might have 
a considerable amount of damage to its joints and its back at that point because uh, there isn't any getting away from the fact that if you break a horse at 18 months to two years those joints aren't fused they do you know have malformations and problems with them so I think it's just trying to if you wanted to do it I think you have to arm yourself with the knowledge rather than hoping for the best and uh, there are plenty of really good horse people out there who have never owned thoroughbreds and have found themselves in trouble because they've got an unknown beast on their hands because it's so different to what they've had before so so yeah I just think it's it's getting the right knowledge from the right people at the right time um and I think if you do that it's quite easy you know there are there are plenty of retrainers out there who do it really successfully, not because they're geniuses, they just understand the horses, you know, and, and I know that's probably easy to say, isn't it? You know, there are plenty of people out there who are amazing with horses, they just get it and some people have it and some people don't. But I don't actually think they're that complicated. They just, I just don't think there's a lot of education and knowledge in the equestrian world about racing. It, for me, the two industries are very closed. Um, and I deal with racehorse owners all the time. And when I say that to them, they say, yeah, it is. You know, you tell them about advances in equestrian science and racing yards aren't overly interested. They, they don't think it's necessarily relevant to them. So it is changing. It's moving. You know, the likes of um, Phil Kirby and Dan Skelton are amazing horsemen and they definitely are embracing the new and incorporating a lot of equestrian science into their yards and their training and but you know if you're looking at some of the older trainers you know this is and their dad taught them so you can't you can't get away from that sort of genetic way of training and the way that they do it and and you know they get great results and they love their horses it's not you know it's not a criticism it's just that the knowledge between the two industries isn't there if that makes sense yeah, absolutely. I think there is parallels to anything in the horse world there, though, isn't it? Which is you need the knowledge to know what you're doing. You need to find the right people who've done it before, not the ones that just think they can probably work it out. Um, you know, there are still a lot of people in kind of traditional in dressage and show jumping and showing and all sorts of areas that actually aren't up to date with the latest of anything because they know the right way. So why would they need to update their CPD or learn something new for the sake of learning it or think about different ways of doing things? So I do think that, you know, actually there's parallels to everything there, but really key, like you say, in, in racing and in thoroughbreds, because actually it sounds like to me, what you've said is, is lovely, which is they are amazingly wonderful breed. They're fantastic and lovely and they'll give you what, what it is that you want as long as you get the right one and as long as you do it the right way. And it's a slightly different way to how you might normally do something. So that's where the nuance comes in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, once you've got them there, once you've retrained them, and I have to say, I, I did see something about somebody put on the thing about retraining. And it's a bit of a buzzword because you've got this racehorse and somebody said, oh, have you got to retrain it? And actually, she's got a really good one. And she said, oh, I've just got on it. You know, I haven't got to retrain it at all. And you know, some of them are like that, and maybe you don't, maybe retraining is not the right word, but once you actually physically sort of adjust them, you know, like make that transition, they make amazing equestrian horses. They'd be your partner for life because they, they really want to love you and get loved. And when you first get some of them, that's not obvious. Um, some of them are quite emotionally shut down. Um, and it can be frustrating because in the maybe they haven't learned to love because of the environment they're in. And sometimes that can take a year, 18 months to get that love. And you, you probably do think some days, I don't know why I'm doing this because this horse doesn't even like me, <laughs> alone love me. You know, I'm throwing everything at it, all my money, all my time. Um, and, you know, they try and bite and kick me. So. <laughs> and and that does happen but some of that is just the way they're conditioned and the thing about racing it does happen is they get pushed to a, a, a sort of a cliff edge and some of them go over the cliff edge where they just don't cope and they do mentally shut down and if you end up with one that's mentally shut down it does take a long time to get them back and sort of some of the things that 
you find or when you feed them they can be very aggressive when you're putting their feed in so like in racing they don't tend to put feeds in stables what they do is they have um turnstiles on the stables so they they throw the cubes in and then they spin the the bucket round and it goes into stables so they're not used to being fed by hand you know they don't get a lot of treats or tidbits you know it depends on the size of the yard you know it's not everything is a bit of a generalization you can't you know if you've got a, a small yard with a trainer who's got 30 it's going to be very different from say one of the big yards which has got 300 so but you do find that they, they've never taken a carrot off somebody and they don't know what it is so yeah sometimes these horses get a bit mentally shut down and don't even really know how to interact with people as people expect riding horses to interact with them and they're not you know they don't think you should give up on them I just think you have to give them the time and if you give those horses the time they end up being the ones that are amazing you know they're the ones that love you and they will take you around and do anything that you want to do with them but you they just take that a little bit longer to get that trust and that bond with you so so yeah so it's it's horses for courses but so it does sound like you know it's it's an incredibly rewarding thing to do but you know don't take it on lightly like you know if you're going to take a, a racer off the track you've got to have time patience you've got to go through a learning journey you've got to surround yourself with the right people you've got to like you know take it at the pace the horse needs it to do so if you're someone that wants a horse to go and enjoy you know grass grassroots riding club activities and things like that then perhaps taking one off the track won't give you what you want fast enough or quick enough potentially um you might yeah. want to consider whether that's the right option for you because i think a lot of people do that they get you know certainly i've come across get an x racer it's got a lovely temperament or whatever they've got one of those ones that probably just wasn't fast enough or didn't really have that will to go and they've kind of gone oh you know it's really sweet turn him out for six months or something and then bring him back and go right okay here we go we're going to start doing riding club stuff now and all these things and they're teaching them like you say they're kind of starting them a bit like they would start a, a, a restart a six-year-old or something like that but actually even having been turned out for six months their body's not going to suddenly change that much and they're not going to have learned some of the stuff that maybe a, a leisure horse might have learned so yeah what's your kind of thinking on you know people that think oh it's all right we'll just turn them away for a bit and, and then we'll we'll crack on well I actually don't advise anybody to turn them away unless they have really hit a mental point where they can't cope one of the real reasons I don't think you should turn a racehorse away is that when you look at um spinal x-rays of x race horses, the majority have what we call some sort of pathology some of it's mild and some of it's severe and when they're raised they build quite a lot of quite strong back muscle it might be short and contracted and not ideally suited for equestrian but what it does is it protects the spine and as soon as you drop that back muscle that spine all those spine pathologies start to cause pain and irritation and then you can have some real problems on your hands so i just think turning them away can be more harmful than keeping them in work and i don't mean you have to get on and ride them but you can long rein them you know bring them in and make sure they do carrot stretches and sort of belly lift every day to help kind of stretch the spine out and get some suppleness through that back muscle and that's why i mean i just think if you understood where they came from and understood their whole sort of physical makeup you would probably think twice about turning them away i get that there's a big thing that mentally sometimes they need a break and that's what i mean don't you don't need to come in and send them to a dressage competition like in week two but i think that bringing them in say maybe just sticking them on the long reins taking them for a walk in hand you know it's just anything to keep them moving keep them working do they say doing sort of belly lifts and carrot stretches can build immense strength so there was a a vet at Animal Health Trust, uh, Rachel Murray, I think her name is, she did a study of um, creating core strength for horses without ridden work. So she looked at doing groundwork, doing, getting them to walk over poles, long reining them, doing the carrot stretches. She didn't put anybody on either any of the horses backs for three months and she just did a consistent program. And the amount of top line and softness she managed to build into those horses back was incredible now i'm not sure because i can't remember but because she's based down in newmarket 
I would guess the horses you were working on were thoroughbreds and they were probably out of racing. One of the reasons most studies out there are on thoroughbreds is because there's such a surplus in the industry. They do get used for these research studies. So it's quite handy to have that information. But yeah, I mean, I, I, as I say, I don't think that's so mentally horrendous for a horse to come in and do a bit of carrot stretching and a bit of long reining and walk over a few poles. You're not taxing them mentally to the point of sending them over the edge. You can build quite a relationship with them and a bond and get them to, you know, do a bit of liberty work. If that's what you're into, you know, they are really adaptable. You know, some of these horses who are out on gallops across Newmarket, Moulton, they're hacking to the gallops. You know, down at Ditchit where Paul Nichols is, I think there's a massive dairy farm. If you if you come across a milk tanker on one of his horses, they don't bat an eyelid. They're used to it. So there's nothing to say you can't work on other things. I and mean, that's the other thing with racehorses, in my mind, and, and not everybody agrees with me, but thoroughbreds need to work. They are bred to work and they do better. It's a bit like having a border collie and not working it. It just goes self-employed and does its own thing. And I just think that's the same with a thoroughbred. If you don't if you don't get the physical work into them, you have to work them mentally. Because if not, you end up with a monster on your hands. And you not know, not all the time, but you know, as I say, it's all generalizations. But I do think that with a thoroughbred, they thrive, they're intelligent, they thrive on that work, and they are probably akin to a border collie in the dog world that they they need something. So as I say, unless you've got a horse that's really, really shut down and really does need to be turned out. I would try and keep it in some sort of work to start with and build it up. But just, you know, what we were saying at the beginning of sort of before you asked that question, be prepared that it's going to take you two years and don't get it and think I'm going to be out doing ROR show champs at Aintree in August, you know, if you're only getting off the track in May, because that's quite a big ask, really. Cool, thanks. I think that's really useful for people to know because, you know, anything we can do on here that helps to distill, distill myths or dispel myths um, or to, you know, get people thinking about something differently or to really consider an option, um, I think really helps people because, you know, I mean, obviously my point of view is always from a mindset point of view, from a rider and being confident, being able to perform at their best. But, you know, your teammates make such a difference and, and not just the teammates as in your farrier, your saddler, your trainer, and that, but your teammate is in your horse. You know, it, the two yeah. of you have got to be willing able and happy to perform and understand the task at hand and you know so often communication errors come in don't they with horse and rider when actually we presume the horse knows what we're asking for and we get annoyed with it and it gets annoyed back at us because it doesn't know what we're asking for and everyone gets confused and that's when we end up with behaviors that then become behaviors that riders don't want to have in their horses so um I think it's just so important that people learn stuff but it that they get the right information from the right places so if they're thinking, oh, yeah, do you know, this is really interesting. Um, I'd love to learn more from Kirsty. I love the fact that you're teaching us it from a biomechanics, from a body perspective. And you're actually a vet physio, so you really do know what you're talking about here. Um, what, you know, where where can they start finding some stuff out about it from you now? Because this is a huge topic, isn't it? It is huge. I mean, we only started the company in January. Um, so it, it came about on a bit of a storm and... Um, obviously COVID-19 has created some challenges. The plan originally was to do lots of hands-on clinics. So we did the first one at the National Racing College in March. Um, and that was sort of part theory, part practical. And we did um, lots of, we looked at assessing horses and obviously we're just using the horses there that are used to train the jockeys. So they're still in a race style training program because of the way they are so it was great because there was a blank canvas and you could just train them so we still plan to run those hands-on courses um and they we do have one booked in october and we're hoping you know there's 20 places so it's not a huge gathering um but we'll, we'll see what that brings we were just at the process of organizing one in Newmarket at the racing school there and i was supposed to go over to ireland to talk to racehorse to riding horse in Ireland on the 20th of March but obviously that got cancelled right at the last minute <laughs> so then 
the plan was to do some online courses, but in time and not necessarily immediately. But because of the situation, we are just put up module one of the X Race Horse online massage course, which just basically the first module covers anatomy and we look at the joints and the skeleton. And although it's learning some of the basics of any horse, it does look at the thoroughbred and we look at how racing impacts on certain joints and also things like why they're high withered and how that how that's come about via breeding and the performance that that shape of confirmation has and then the second module is on physiology which we look at the respiratory system so we look at racehorses that have breathing ops and why they've had them we look at how racehorses bleed in racing and they, they sort of get a little sort of the, the capillaries in their lungs burst from really intense exercise so quite a few racehorses come out of racing because they're bleeders that's one of the it's, it's a big reason for retirement and it's I mean that's the thing people don't always know that you know a horse that's bled in racing is unlikely to go and do a decent cross country at pace you know because it's that level of exercise that that causes the problem so it's it's worth knowing where they've come from in that sense we look at their digestive system and um, the way they're fed in racing and why that's relevant to you know when you first get them out of racing you might not want to feed them a massive bucket load of racing cubes but to be honest with you you're almost better to do that um only for a few days you know a week two weeks and then you know it's that that gradual change of feed um also we look the third module looks at muscle physiology which links really into the feeding side because racehorses have what we call um, a high proportion up to 90% fast twitch muscle fibers. And the thing about fast twitch muscle fibers is they don't respire with oxygen, they, they need feeding. So what a lot of people do with racehorses is they go, I don't want to feed it because I don't want it to be fast. But actually their muscles don't work effectively if you don't feed them. And then when their muscles don't work and then you ask them to do loads of work, they can't do it and then they throw the toys out the pram because they can't do what you're asking and that sort of links back to what i was saying to you before that people are asking questions of these horses and they can't physically do what you need them to do because people don't understand actually that the muscle type that they have requires food to work effectively and also you're trying to repair probably some damage from racing so if you take the feed out and you don't give them protein those muscles can't repair anyway so then you're always on a losing streak. So you have to find a balance between the nutrition of what you feed a horse and you know the energy you're going to get out. And I think you have to understand the horse that you have and whether, you know, if they are a bit energetic, whether they are for you. Um, because just cutting their feed out isn't necessarily going to solve your problems. Um, so yeah, so we, that's sort of we link that kind of physiology into the muscle side, and then the last two modules are actually on massage strokes and the massage routines. So we look at just doing a quick assessment of posture and confirmation, and understanding texture and tone and what to feel for, and also looking at massage routines. Say if your horse has um, had like a respiratory problem, what kind of massage? routine would work best to, to help that system and help them so so that's that course that's just going out now the one that we plan to do later in the year is much more in depth into looking at the biomechanics of racing looking into the retraining the groundwork the long lining the physical changes um yeah i mean it's not written it's still you know in the process but yeah the nutrition the hoof care i mean obviously everybody knows thoroughbreds have terrible feet um so it's looking at why that is and how you could help and yeah so it's there's the, the whole package of of things out there um ideally i want to be out there talking to people rather than doing it online um the online stuff is uh, it's a mixture of videos diagrams and notes there's not a lot in the way of notes but so it's a lot of me sort of talking you through it really but yeah ideally I want people out there. I want people looking at horses and feeling and learning how to feel because the more you can assess your horse, the quicker you'll pick up on the small problems. Because the thing you find with thoroughbred is they kind of tell you very, very subtly, 
and then they tell you with un the no uncertain terms this is how it is um and the problem is people get hurt when they miss all the previous signs and from a thoroughbred's point of view they're like but i told you you know i told you 20 times but if you miss those cues you know it's yeah it's just it's having that understanding isn't it and and that's what i want to teach people i just want people to notice you know there's subtle postures that they do the way they stand it it really does tell you know i i can walk into a stable and you can tell by the way that they're stood where you're likely to find a problem so and they're really good at standing like that they've although they're stoic they're not stoic as cobs cobs will stand dead square and still have loads of problems but a thoroughbred will go oh no that hurts a little bit i'm just going to take the weight off it a little bit so so yeah so I, I just try and teach people to just look at their horses in a different way and assess them slightly differently that's amazing it's like anything isn't it like competence builds confidence so the more you know about something the more confident you're going to be if you're making the right decisions to be creating my plan and things like that so i think anything i mean wouldn't we all love to be back out there at the moment talking to people face to face and especially being around the horses physically but at the moment you know great we can do some online learning people can learn some about this stuff even if they actually i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna download and watch your course because quite frankly like even if i i don't have an x racer i, I may do one day i don't know but why why would i not want to know about this stuff it's really useful you know to to sort of spot things and know stuff for other people well that's it and you it is transferable isn't it you know once you you kind of look at it from a thoroughbred's point of view but you can kind of go well my warm blood is like this but i'll look at my warm blood in a different light now because actually i hadn't thought about that and it, and it is it is cross transferable i mean i know see my passion is from the thoroughbred side um you know the business is sort of i've got to register it with social enterprise but the idea is that the the business will produce profits that then mean that we can offer free training to people who have got themselves basically into a pickle um and it does happen i get you know people message me and say i've just got to the end of the line with this horse and i don't know what to do and there are people out there that are struggling and when you get to that end of line you i can't sell the horse you know usually by that point you've either got a massive behavioral problem or a huge vet bill coming um so i ideally is that you know in the long term the business will stop you know the aim is to try and stop those cases occurring quite so frequently but also as a business we want to be able to provide some support to those people and if that's in offering them free training on free advice and whatever we can do um what we try to what we're trying to stop is horses ending up in welfare charities you know these welfare charities for x race horses are full they're all full you know they're all you know they can they, there's never enough places for the horses out there um because people take them on and they can't cope and it's not their fault you know they they genuinely take them on with the best intentions they really do but sometimes it's just too much um and there's a say with five thousand a year retiring not everybody who's dreaming that rehoming those horses are doing it responsibly so you know you you can be open to to that sort of problem really so yeah that's where we are as a business that we we are trying to have a social impact and and let some good come out of it and try and reduce the, the number of horses that end up in a welfare situation i think that's great because i think you know so many people are passionate about this and they and they they take on the horses and they retrain them and then they try and find the good homes but again like you say there's only a certain amount that they can do but actually if you can get out there and reach more people and, and educate them and train them as to whether it's a good idea for them whether it's right for them and if they still decide it is what it is they can be doing and how they can really be you know armed with knowledge to do the very best they can then hopefully you're going to reach more people and help more horses in the long run yeah than it would have if you just set up your own retraining company you know yeah exactly and you can know if you have your retraining company you can only retrain so many in a year you know and i, I say i work for the british thoroughbred retraining center up in lancashire and they still only have so many in a year it's you know you're not churning out hundreds of thousands you know you're not you're definitely getting anywhere near five thousand are you so 
you, you'd limit it. And like I said before, there just doesn't seem to be any opportunities to learn. I can't honestly find anyone who can tell you, you know, some of these basic things. But if you go to a retraining yard, most of them know it just because they've worked with these horses for so long that they've learned it through, you know, their own just their own experiences and their own knowledge and, and some of them are probably bad experience you know we, we learn from things that we fail at don't we so yeah and unfortunately if you fail at something oh, that could be a horse that you know didn't end up with the best outcome and I'm not saying you can't save every horse you know you never you never will do unfortunately but I do hope that we can make a difference um, and one of the other things that I've quite interested in is hearing from people who have got experience with thoroughbreds so the riding instructors the farriers the physios because it'd be lovely to have a register of people that people can turn to and say we have riding instructors who do try to help and they've you know again they, they genuinely want to help but they don't have the right experience so you know that is something that we are really interested in in doing is being able to direct people to the right people in their area because you know if you're not near the peak district near me or I don't know somebody in your area it's it's hard isn't it who, who do you recommend to go and help and you know I'm not going to jump in the car and drive 300 miles <laughs> any given day you know, I might do for the uh, the special occasions but um in the main no but it would be good to have that network of of people that really know what they're doing yeah and i think that's great that also you could train up if you're a riding instructor and you want to know more about thoroughbreds and things like that then you can come and learn from you and ultimately get that knowledge to be able to help more so you know you're building that network by training people and that's always yeah. the best way to to share knowledge you can't do it all yourself you've got to train and trust others to, yeah. to, to learn your your experience and, your, and that's how learning works is it, you know like that's yeah. how you learn from other people and hopefully yeah. you shortcut their mistakes you shortcut they say this is where i learned the trial and error away and unfortunately there's always casualties along the way when that's the case so i'm going to teach you some of the stuff to so you can avoid that and we can all move forward a bit faster so yeah super well i'm, I'm just going to read you some of the comments very very long term is that we wanted to be able to pull some staff out of racing it was people who want to leave racing and for them to be people delivering some of the training you know that there are lots of people who don't want to work in racing because it's quite a hard lifestyle um, or they get injured or whatever and it would be great to have the knowledge of these people because they know more about these horses than anybody but like I said to you before it's a very closed industry that the two don't seem to talk openly at the moment I don't think. Dale that's great so even providing a career for a, a career for the for the ex-racehorse people. <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah yeah cool so people have been writing loads of great things so Joe said thank you so much for saying this um oh this was when you were talking about actually pushing them through and just kicking on and stuff i've argued this for so long you can't push them through things when they're rehabbing or they're retraining hallelujah so that was from joe um and then andre said fantastic to go forward with empathy there's some really great points here thank you cassie said this is so interesting she's also said this is so good i'm currently having a discussion this was about turning your horse away currently having a discussion with an owner at present whose vet thinks that turning the horse away without actually investigating deeper is going to be beneficial and then start like hacking my argument is that the, all the muscle that's developed is going to be wasted and then you'll be getting on a physically weaker change physically weaker horse when the horse is naturally quite weak already so just to cover that off then what's your thoughts on on that i agree i think why turning them away isn't going to rehab an injury you know it's not suddenly going to heal itself because all that horses do is they compensate so what hurts they take the pain away from that area and it doesn't heal it just becomes an even weaker area so you know it's like if you had a bad left hip you use your right leg loads and you keep using your right leg and then your left hip doesn't hurt quite so much but it hasn't healed you just have strengthened the other side and then you've left the other side to remain weak and not to say the body doesn't heal all the time it does try to but there's an awful lot of science that says that you know 
there's millions of physiotherapists out there in both the human and the animal world and if what we were doing wasn't correct we wouldn't have jobs and careers and the reason for that is you are probably better knowing what the problem is and solving it now you investigate it and it could be turning it away for a period of time is beneficial but i would probably say i would find out what the problem is now because you might be able to solve it with medicating and rehab um and this is always a bit of a controversial issue with medication but i will give you my take on medication because it's a bit different to a lot of people's if you medicate an area of a horse you have an opportunity to then rehab that area so when you medicate if you then turn away and do hardly any work with it you've wasted that medication the idea is you take the pain away so that then you can build the muscle and you support the structures around it and you can protect the joints and the skeleton so many people just either medicate and get on and go or they medicate and then they put them in the field for a couple of weeks and you're like well what a waste of medication um why would you do that if you are going to go down that route of medicating and there are arguments for and against for it absolutely but use it to do something positive and beneficial and that is doing the correct appropriate amount of work to help try and build some muscle at the time to you know most of the physio that we do is about supporting the structures you know building the strength making that muscle is strong and as flexible and supple as possible and then you take the strain of the joints and the more you don't have strain on the joints the less likely you are to have things like arthritis and given the intensity of the work that racehorses do arthritis is high up there with things that happen so the the, the better you get with, with with strength and putting strength in the easier things are that's great thank you and i absolutely love and share your view there on medication that actually it seems to be a fix but it's not fixed it's a catalyst if you then do the right stuff yeah absolutely okay so um another just another comment that came in was how about some train the trainer day so is that something that you would put on you know yeah i, mean, I have to say i haven't done much with that um the first i say I only done one course and say so we're a really new company we only started on january the first literally um and the first course i put in uh, a few physios came i think we had 22 on the day and i think there was four or five physios in the room um and the comments were that the course was probably aimed a bit high for the owners in the room that i'd that some of the information was a bit technical and a bit full on um and the thing is i just love to give people as much information as i can and i forget that some people don't have the basics and it, i find it really hard to try and dumb it down but that and that sounds rude doesn't it i don't mean it to sound rude but it it's it, sometimes you forget the 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 amount of technical detail that you give to people so i'd always been a bit uh, the plan is to help the owners you know the idea is to help the horses to help the owners but yeah there's definitely a chain there where so you help the trainers to help the owners you can expand that network out and it's definitely something to consider um but as i say we're only four months old <laughs> Oh, but it just shows you there's an appetite though, doesn't it? It just shows that what you're doing is great and good and, and exactly what you want there. And and that's absolutely the way to do it is if you can train the trainers, they will help the owners, then you're 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 giving that knowledge, but you're not having to do it yourself. Um yeah. and you know, run a million training days and still not reach enough people, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like I say, if you help one trainer and they've got 20 clients or a hundred clients, you know there are 100 people that haven't come on my course but one person that did then you know your reach becomes greater doesn't it so yeah, yeah absolutely is definitely one to think about and it's exactly why i um i have a licensed a licensed um fcc um course myself so that people that want to learn to do what i do can start learning it and helping their people out as well because i can't physically can't do it yeah but that's not enough for me i've got to train my own so yeah 
but that's awesome so thank you so so much Kirsty. um you know everyone said this is absolutely brilliant it's really useful it's useful for any horses but particularly to understand thoroughbreds and i've definitely learned some really interesting stuff today about some things i didn't know about how they were kept and how their bodies are which actually is really obvious when you think about it but that's that's the thing about knowledge isn't it you don't know what you don't know yeah. um and then when you do start learning it you suddenly realize how much you don't know and and that's how it works isn't it and then you start yeah. knowing what you know and and then and then you reach the point you're at which is where you know so much you don't realize how much you know and you've got to try and bring it back down to the level of those who don't again which is <laughs> but thank you so much for it i've been absolutely brilliant really fascinating we will put some links and bits in i think your courses are going to go on to courses and things as well aren't they so as soon as yep. they're available we will tell people about that um but yeah so thank you so much is there anything you wanted to add or tell anyone before we go no as i say it's thoroughbred transitions with facebook instagram um yeah and you can find the links to the courses on there as well and, and we'll we'll get you the first module over to put on horsey courses so yeah and if you've got a problem if you if you need any help um, just drop me a message and i might you know i try and help as many people as i can but i might be pointing in the direction of somebody else who can can help so yeah feel free to reach out if you need any help lovely cool well thank you so much and um that's it from us today see you bye Percy. Bye.